Snap Judgment Studios. Get a behind-the-scenes look at Comedy Central's The Daily Show on Beyond the Scenes, an original podcast from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Every week, host Roy Wood Jr. goes deeper with notable guests and experts from the Emmy Award-winning series, and together, they use comedy to tackle current topics, from gentrification to gun laws, and take a closer look at how and why these topics matter. Listen to Beyond the Scenes from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Tuesday. Odoo is the most popular open source ERP for many reasons. It's affordable, easy to use. However, most companies rely on Odoo because their applications are fully integrated. But wait, what does fully integrated mean? Imagine a mechanic. They don't waste time running around a shop looking for tools. They keep everything they need in one convenient toolbox. Odoo is just like that. But instead of a hammer or a wrench, you get applications for every aspect of your company. They're always connected and communicating with each other, letting you stay up to date at all times. For a free trial, visit odoo.com slash snap. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash snap. Okay, so fourth grade. The teacher's saying something the eternity seconds click away once every eon. So hot. So bored. Carl leans over to me. Whispers, hey, hey, this Saturday, I dare you to pee on the electric fence. I dare you too. I say right back. And I know Carl never, ever backs down. Never. And Carl will never, ever see me back down either. We're farm boys. We do what we say and say what we mean. But I don't want to pee on an electric fence. It's just another one of Carl's stupid ideas. I can already hear my dad at the hospital. He did what? But there's no help for it. I got to do it. I got to. So I start thinking, what do I know about electric fences? What? And it turns out, big country that I am, I know quite a bit. See, here's the thing about electric fences you urbanites might not understand. Electric fences are only on sometimes. Farmers want to pop it enough so that the cattle are scared to touch them. But you don't want to waste all your money pouring electricity into a fence after they get the message, see? So you turn it on every once in a while. And you can turn the fence up low or up high for the bad ombre cows that aren't making America great again. But we digress. I start thinking, I'm going to pee on the fence when it ain't on. But how to tell? I can't just ask Farmer Ted. It's his fence. Word will get back. So that afternoon I go home and I sit in front of the fence. And if you stare long enough, it's like you can tell. There's a hum in the air, a crackle. You could almost see the magnetic energy field ready, waiting. And then it stops. The pop goes out of the air. For hours I watch until I know the rhythm of the fence, the dance of the fence master. Saturday comes. I'm going first. You go later. I tell Carl, he looks relieved. He won't be. I make a big show about how scared I am. I bend over and smell the angry wire. (laughs) You gotta be crazy to pee on that. But there's nothing, no pitch, no hum, no magnetic field. It's gonna sting, Carl. I look back with fear in my eyes. Here I go, Carl. I pull trowel and let fly. And it's not just my willy that is electrocuted. A spasm of voltage sizzles my spine, the back of my brain, my liver, my kidneys. The shockage sends me 10 feet in the air, crashing down on my back, trembling, groaning foam, leaking from my eyes, my mouth, my nose. 
Oh, man. You're something special. I ain't never seen nothing like that. Man, fried. That's what you got. I can't believe you did it. Can't believe it. I even asked Ted to turn it to 10. I said there's nothing this kid won't do, and I was right. I'll tell you what. <sighs> My brain hurt. Whatever bet this is, you win. Paul, kill me if I did something crazy like that. <sighs> Look over at the fence. And the fence he grins right back at me. I don't know what happened. I still don't know what happened. Either I read it wrong or it turned on right when I did my business. I don't know. But you can imagine my surprise. A few weeks ago, I turned on the TV to see two science guys announce that it's impossible to get zapped from peeing on a fence. I can prove otherwise. I can But Carl, if you're listening right now, I think it's safe to say it's your turn. Today on Snap Judgment, we proudly present Metal. Amazing story from real people with a special kind of grit. My name is Glenn Washington. Always know when to say when when you're listening to Snap Judgment. Now, for our first story, Norman Olsat, he grew up with a tough guy father who dragged him along for life and death outdoor adventures, and Norman avoided it as best he could until one fateful day. Please note, this piece does contain graphic elements. Snap Judgments, Davey Kim brings us a story about how everything changed. Eleven-year-old Norman Olstad III is on a short chartered flight with his dad and his dad's girlfriend, Sandra. They're traveling from Santa Monica Airport in Southern California to Big Bear Mountain. Norman's going to train with the local ski team and pick up a ski slalom championship trophy he won a little while back. You know, we're heading that way, and my dad's reading the sports section, eating an apple, which is his classic morning routine. My dad was in really good spirits because I'd won the ski race the day before, which was sort of a payoff for all our hard work. But Norman wasn't excited because, well, he was just burnt out. As far back as Norman can remember, his dad plugged him into every sport imaginable, scooping him out of kindergarten to go surfing or skiing down black diamond runs. His dad even gave him a nickname, Boy Wonder, for all the medals he won and his father-son adventures. Most of Norman's friends were kind of jealous. I didn't necessarily think it was cool, actually. I wanted to be on my bicycle, you know, riding around with my friends. I didn't want to be driving for nine hours to go to a ski race. I didn't want to be getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go to hockey practice. I wanted to spend the night at somebody's house, do a sleepover, wake up, watch cartoons. (laughs) I missed a lot of birthday parties, and so, yeah, I, I resented that. I would complain. He would just sort of respond with something like, Jeez, Olstead, I mean, look at this. We got the snow. We got our skis on. Don't worry about being cold. If you ski a little bit, you'll warm up. (laughs) I remember where we were skiing a chute. It was way too deep for me. I was eight, nine years old. And the sides of the, the little bowl we were in was like a wall of snow, and I rammed into it got my head stuck in the snow and I couldn't breathe. And my dad came, skied up behind me, and pulled me out. I said, did you see what happened? I almost drowned. He said, no, no, I had an eye on you the whole time. You were fine. He was not worried about me drowning or anything. He thought I was just looking for an excuse. He said, you know, come on, let's go. Tough it out. I thought that was pushing it too far. Up ahead, I could see through the windshield that the tops of the mountains were sort of cut off by dark gray clouds. I had the headphones on, so I remember hearing one of the radar towers mention that that another plane had, had called in saying that the weather around Big Bear was really bad and that he had to go around the area. 
there seemed to be sort of suggestion that maybe we would want to return to L.A. And the pilot did not respond to that. His responses were like, oh, no, we're okay, we're good. Definitely made me think, huh, maybe I'm going to tell my dad what I'm hearing, but, you know, the pilot is the pilot. Not long after that, all of a sudden, we were in a snowstorm. You couldn't see out the windows. The plane was shaking. We start to actually bounce around. It's kind of scary. This went on for a few minutes until I noticed pilots moving more frantically. I can hear the engine straining, revving. I remember at this point thinking, I gotta tell my dad. I looked back at him and he was smiling and he was eating the core of the apple, which he did. He even ate the stem. He he used the stem to kind of clean his teeth out after he devoured the whole of the apple. And he just was glowing and smiling and he, he had these really strong sapphire blue eyes. Seeing him like that just sort of dampened my, my willingness to sort of say anything. I see through the fog and the snow a tree limb down kind of lower than where we are. And I think, there's no way. And now that I saw the tree limb, I thought, I gotta say something. And before I could, watch out. Curled my body up, three hard thuds. And then I woke up and I was on the side of a mountain. The Cessna plane was just a couple hundred feet shy of making it over the mountain peak. Instead, it had crashed into the San Gabriel Mountains. Now, it was hanging off a cliff over 8,000 feet in the air. When I woke up the first time and I look around There's snow and kind of pieces of metal. Figured it was a dream. I went back to sleep. I woke up the second time. I couldn't breathe because the seatbelt was like choking my my stomach. So I remember unlatching the seatbelt and calling out for my father. I didn't hear anything back. It was something I had said before, like when snow went into my mouth and I was choking. You know, he pulled me out. I remember that jarring me a little bit. So I kind of wiggled out of the seat, and the first thing I saw was two feet sticking up with shoes on. It was the pilot's legs, and then I saw his head. He was on his back, and the back of his head, I could tell, had sort of bled out into the snow. Then, Then I knew it was real. I called out for my father again, and that's when Sandra called back. And she was about 10 or 15 feet up the slope, and she was still in her seat, which had sort of torn away from the plane. I crawled up to her, found her, and she had a big wound in her forehead, and within seconds I realized that one of her shoulders had dislocated. It was kind of just hanging down like a broken wing. Sandra was very panicked. She was talking in circles and mumbling. Norman helped Sandra hobble down under the plane wing and made a small shelter. That's when he saw his dad for the first time since the crash. His dad was still buckled to his chair, but was exposed to the freezing air. So Norman plunged his bare hands, van shoes, and knees into the snow and crawled along the mountain edge to where his dad was sitting. Ultimately, he wanted to move his dad into the makeshift shelter with Sandra. And I got to him and he was slumped forward with his head kind of on his knees. I shook him, trying to wake him up. I had nothing. But he still felt warm. And that made me think that he had just been knocked out. And I got under him, and I pushed, and I got on the side of him, and I pulled without sending him down the slope like everything else that moves. I'm this little 11-year-old. I was only 75 pounds, and I didn't have the strength to move his body. I was freezing. My hands were frozen. And my toes were frozen. I had no gloves. I had Vans tennis shoes, no, no ski cap or anything. 
and I had to get out of there. So I went back to the wing and I got under with Sandra and we, we spooned for body heat. We fell asleep. I had another almost dreamlike thing where I had had a conversation with my father a year before this. His truck had gotten caught in mud and we were wandering around looking for help. It was really hot. I remember asking him about what happens when you boil to death. He told me something like, you're thirsty and you're kind of disoriented. And, and then I said, well, what happens when you freeze to death? And he said, well, you're really cold and then you get tired and you fall asleep and you just don't wake up. Here I am asleep, it's freezing, and I'm conscious of the fact that I have to wake up. So I made myself wake up. I woke Sandra up. And I said, you know, we can't sleep. I mean, we're freezing to death. At that point, I hear these booming kind of sound that right away sounds like a helicopter to me. I'm excited to hear this helicopter. And so I get out from under the wing, and it's hovering above us, and I start screaming and yelling and waving my arms. Hey, I'm, we're here, we're here, right here, right here. Helicopter's kind of like bobbing and weaving and dipping. And I'm thinking he sees me and very excited. I'm screaming and yelling and waving. Suddenly, the helicopter just banks away. At that point, Norman could feel the storm picking up again. But before the angry gray clouds obscured his view over the mountain edge, Norman carefully peered down and saw among some trees... Well, he thought he saw a cabin roof. I remember thinking, aha, you know, if nobody comes for us, we got to get to that cabin before dark. I go back and Sandra is asleep again and I wake her up and I tell her, we're going to freeze to death up here. We can't spend the night up here. And she says, oh no, somebody will come and we can't get down that mountain. And I tell her, look, I'm going. You have to come finally got her out of there from under the wing. Now I broke off some tree limbs and I said, we're gonna use these as like little ice axes and you're gonna jam this into the snow. You're gonna lay on your stomach and your feet are gonna go down first and I'll be below you, Sandra, and you'll keep your weight on my shoulders. I went back to my father and, and I told him that I was gonna get help for us. We start down the mountain, very, very steep. At this point, you can't really see very far below anymore. At one point, Sandra kind of wandered to my right and had lost contact with me a little bit. She sat up, and I was telling her not to. Simultaneously, she sort of rolled away from me. I would sort of lose grip and start sliding, so she would start sliding. I sort of reached out, sort of leaned over to try to stop her, and she just bowled me right over and just kept sliding away, and she just shooting down the slope and just disappeared into the fog, into the clouds. Boom, she was gone. Norman spent the next hour following the blotchy trail of blood Sandra had left behind in the snow. When he finally found her, she was lying on her back under a cluster of trees. And her eyes were open. And I spoke to her and shook her, but she was dead. It was like I knew she was dead. I broke off all these tree limbs, and I tried to pile them on her just so that the snow wouldn't build up right on her, and maybe they'd keep her warm. And as I did that, I remember thinking, you know, I'm the one that made her come down the mountain. Felt badly about that. I sort of lost it for a second. I'm exhausted, I'm starving, and I'm basically just going to die right here. I remember sort of like laying on these rocks, hearing my father, geez, Olstead, I mean, look at this. We got the snow. Don't worry about being cold. If you ski a little bit, you'll warm up. That's when I realized... Jeez, if I had skis and I was with my dad, we would just ski down this. I used the two sticks I had, and I sat on my butt 
and let myself slide down the mountain. And I used the sticks to plant in the snow to slow me down, but also to sort of make slalom turns. The inspiration to slalom down on my butt came from all my ski adventures with my father. Slalom race was my forte. In fact, that was the race I had just won the day before. After a while, God, you know, I'd fumble and scrap my way down this mountain. Suddenly I sort of plopped down onto this meadow. It was the first flat ground I'd been on in, at that point, probably eight, eight and a half hours. At that point, I see fresh footprints in the snow, and so I followed them. They deposited me onto this dirt road, and so I started down the dirt road in the direction of where I thought the cabin was. As I came around the bend, a dog came running up. Seconds later was a teenage boy. You know, he kind of looked at me startled. Before I could speak, he said, were you in the airplane crash? And I was like, yeah. He says to me, let me pick you up. And I said, no, I'll walk. But he just picked me up anyway. I'm cradled in his arms and it, it felt good. He's carrying me down this dirt road and I'm looking back up at the mountain that I'd just come down and seeing it as this thing and the storm and the clouds, this thing that was like, you know, try to beat me and I beat it. That was the first time in, in a long time that I became sad and thought about my father. You know, all those things I did with my father, I had to use so much of that, more so the state of mind, the mentality. And thinking my dad's still up there, frozen, and the snow piling up on his body. And it was the first time I thought, you know, he might be dead. How can something like that happen? And he was like my Superman. He was always the strongest, smartest, yet here I am alive. I just sort of thought he, he gave that to me. He saved my life. He taught me how to survive. It was the first time I, I ever appreciated the things he dragged me through. The plane, groping through the fog, heading for a ski resort in the mountains above Los Angeles, went down yesterday morning. For hours, helicopters searched for the wreckage and survivors. As it turned out, there was only one, 11-year-old Norman Olstad. I just, I tried to wake my dad up, couldn't get him, or the pilot. And, my, my, and the skin on my hands kept coming off, you know, bleeding really bad. You know, I never gave up, my dad never, taught me never to give up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Norman. Norman is still an avid skier, and he takes his two kids on the same runs he did with his father. Read more about this story in Norman's book, Crazy for the Storm, and also check out his latest thriller, French Girl with the Mother. We'll have a link to both on our website, snapjudgment.org. The original score was by Davy Kim, and it was produced by Davy Triple Threat Kim. Now, when Snap Judgment returns, a little boy has to prove himself, and a community stands down the most powerful force ever assembled. When Snap Judgment, the metal episode continues, stay tuned. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a mental health professional in your pocket. Talkspace offers both therapy and psychiatry. 
and being able to reach out to a provider anytime, anywhere makes addressing mental health super easy and getting started is the most important part. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code JUDGMENT to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's JUDGMENT and Talkspace.com. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the metal episode. Now, imagine. Summertime, 1953. Ten-year-old Greg Williams. He's living in Virginia with his mom, dad, and three siblings. Life is good. Until the day his mom left. A week passed and a couple weeks passed. She had never been gone for a period of more than two or three days. And so it became clear to me that maybe she wasn't coming back. Greg's mom and dad were always getting in fights. His dad drank too much. And after a while, she couldn't take it. She'd just pack up the kids and leave. But this time, she'd only taken the two youngest, leaving Greg and his brother Mike with his dad. On his 40th birthday, he really pretty much had a breakdown uh, and decided he couldn't go any further, and we just kind of left everything there. They were leaving a big house and a restaurant that had once supported the family. And now, they had to beg for bus fare to get to Muncie, Indiana. We saw the, the bus trip as our salvation. And so my brother and I got on the bus with incredible anticipation. And that's when Greg's dad leaned across the aisle and said, Boys, I've got something to tell you, and I wonder, what is this? What has he got to tell us? And he said, do you remember Miss Sally? And I did remember Miss Sally. She was this tall, thin black woman who had worked for us in the restaurant. But I never had a good relationship with her. She seemed unfriendly. He said, Miss Sally is my mother, and she's your grandmother. And I was in a state of shock at the time. I I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it because my dad, he didn't look black. Now my dad, I started looking at him a little closely, and he didn't really look white. Uh, But I remember he told me that he was Italian, and that's why he called himself Tony. And Greg's dad didn't just tell them his story. He also said, And in Virginia, you were white boys. But in Indiana, you're going to be colored boys. And your life is going to be different. And I looked at him and, you know, I said, Dad, Dad, it can't be. It can't be. But it was true. His dad was really James Williams. James had grown up black with Miss Sally and Muncie. But his father was white. It wasn't until he was in college at Howard University, a traditionally black school, that he convinced himself the only way to get ahead was to be white. So he dropped out, changed his name, married a white woman, and moved to Virginia, where he raised his children as white. And now here's Greg. My brow was furrowed and head down, wondering what's next. Everybody's going to know that I'm colored, and how am I going to be treated? So they get to Muncie, the town where his mom and dad had met, and both sides of the family still lived. But instead of going to see their white grandma, they went to a different side of town, to Miss Sally's sister's house. Dad knocked on her door, and he said, Boys, this is Aunt Bess, uh, which was my grandmother's sister. And so she said, well, get in here, boys. You've got to be hungry. And she took us into the kitchen and fed us. We had homemade biscuits and had a big pot of beans on the table. And so she kind of found a little bed back in her living room for me and Mike. So the next day was his first day at school. And Greg had never been to an integrated school before. At recess time, we go out in the little playground. 
and I see the black kids going to one direction, the white kids going to another direction, and can't decide where do I go. There was these two little white girls that walk over to me, and so they started asking me questions about life in Washington, you know, the cherry blossoms, you know, the president. I was just overjoyed. Things were going great. He had these new friends, and he was doing well in school. And a couple days later, he sees his new friends. They had frowns on their faces. They turn and they ran back to school. And I just was confused. I didn't know what had happened. And that's when his black cousin, Mary Lou, she said, I told everybody you were colored boys. Greg and his brother were the talk of the town. I mean, everybody knew these were two little white black boys. And they also knew about the one drop rule. You were either all black or you were white. And if you were any part black, you were all black. There was no biracial. There was no mixed race. So it was not a life that I wanted. I saw the hatred on the faces of the white boys. I saw the hatred on the faces of the black boys. I was being called a by white boys, called a a by the black boys. People throwing rocks at our house, breaking windows at our house, calls we would get in the middle of the night. How was I going to survive on a day-to-day basis? So Greg turned to his father because James Williams had gone through it before. He painted this very vivid dream for me that people in Muncie did not understand me. They had no idea how to deal with a mixed-race kid. Uh, uh, I said, but that is here, and you don't have to be a prisoner of all the things that are happening here to you, that you have the ability to go out there and change your life. So I bought into the dream. As big as his father dreamed, the everyday reality was the exact opposite. He struggled to keep a steady job and continued to drink off and on. He used to take Greg and his little brother Mike to a gambling spot called the Dewdrop Inn. My dad liked to go there because he could uh, beg for money for a drink or a bottle of wine. They had a little act. Greg would recite Invictus or the Gettysburg Address, and his brother would do handstands and flips. One day we were going through that, and he said something. I said, there's my white boy. My white boy's over there. And I said, Dad, I'm not white. And I said, no, you're a white boy. You're going to be a white boy. And then he got everybody else in the chorus who were all black, and they said, yeah, you're a white boy. You're a white boy. And I said, I'm not a white boy. And I just got so mad, I just left the dude drop in, just went out and slammed the door. Greg was sick of his dad's behavior. He would leave for long stretches of time, and they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. Their relatives didn't have enough money to support them, and he felt like nobody cared. But that's when he met Miss Dora, a widow from the neighborhood. Miss Dora was incredible. She saw us. She was a church-going woman who was making no money, $25 a week. Her church members told her, don't take those boys, don't take those boys. They have white relatives, they have black relatives. You're just a poor, widow, black woman. You don't have a responsibility to take those boys. She said, you're my boys, and I'm going to take you both in, even though I don't have much money, but you can share this house with me, and we can try to make a life together. When I was in fights with white boys and black boys and came home crying, that Miss Dora was the one who put her arms around me, that she's the closest thing to a mother that I ever had. Meanwhile, his white relatives didn't want to have anything to do with him. In high school, Greg shared a class with a cousin who never talked to him. But one day, he walks up to Greg, holding something in his hands. He shows me this little kind of dime store photo, and it's a picture of my mother. 
Uh, and he said, you know, here's a picture of your mom that I have. And I was thinking, what is this little jerk, you know, doing with a picture of my mother? I mean, he's closer to my mother than I am. But I wanted that picture. I wanted that picture. I said, can I have it? And I begged him. For, you know, I hated myself. I begged him for the picture. And uh, he gave me that picture. And so I said, that's my mother. This picture was the only thing he had left of his mom. She wasn't there to see him win the state championship in basketball or graduate from high school, or even later when he was sworn in as a deputy sheriff. He rarely thought about her until one day when he was on duty answering calls. Greg picked up the phone and it was a voice he hadn't heard in years, his mom's brother. He said, Greg, your mother is in Muncie and she would like to see you and Mike. And I said, I don't know. I'll think about it. I'll, I'll talk to Mike and see what we want to do, and I'll let you know. I did have a tinge of excitement, but there had been such anguish and hurt and anger over the years that I said, why now? I mean, I've got a job. I'm going to graduate from college. And I had suffered through all those years, and she hadn't shown up. We didn't get one card, letter, telephone call for all those years. I don't want any part of it. But there was still a hesitancy in my part. I said, well, you know, it is my mother. I haven't seen her. I, I kind of would like to see her and, and hear about my sister and my brother and what happened to them. And so I called Mike and said, Mike, you know, Mom is here in town and she wants to see us. He immediately said, yeah, yeah, I want to see her. I said, well, Mike, are you sure? You know, she kind of let us down. And Mike and I talked for a while and ultimately we decided to see her. And so I called my uncle back. I said, well... I don't get off till 11 o'clock tonight, and uh, I'll pick Mike up if that's not too late. And said, no, 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 she wants to see you. She wants to see you. So I picked Mike up after I got off, and we drove out to the, to the house uh, and walked up there and knocked on the front door, and I had my best deputy sheriff badge and uniform and scowl on my face because I was not going to take any crap from my mother. She came out and this kind of little frail looking woman, last time I'd seen her, she was bigger than me, taller than me, heavier than me. And I said, this is my mother. I can't believe it. Immediately, we all embraced and we dissolved into tears uh, because it had been 12 years without any connection. Um, and so there was a lot, uh, a lot lost. His mom lived in a suburb outside of D.C. with Greg's brother and sister, who still didn't know they were a quarter black. She had remarried, this time to a white man named Ken. She said, well, I've talked to Ken, and uh, he wants you guys uh, to have you as family. We can all, he's going to adopt you, and you can come back and live with us and go to school and change your name, and, you know, everything is going to be fine. She wanted Greg to go back to being white. Mike is sitting there, you can see him, you know, just kind of taking it all in. Wow, you know, my life could be different, could be changed, and, you know, things could be different, but then I kind of check myself and say, no, no. She knew we were living with Miss Dora. My black family never disowned me. If we went with her, all the past had to be obliterated. That means that I would have to walk away from all the people who had helped me survive, you know, Muncie, uh, who had helped me at a time when no one else was reaching out, who had fed us, who had clothed us, who had supported us. I said, well, you know, I'd like to come and see you, but I've, I've got school and I've got a lot of things to do here, so I can't, I can't go. And I just didn't say I'd totally reject your offer, but I knew that this just, this just was not going to work for me. I've identified myself as black. 
That's the world I grew up in. That's the world I was part of. It was never a price that I would be willing to pay. Big thanks to Greg Williams for sharing his story with Snap. Greg wrote a book all about his experience in Muncie. It's called Life on the Color Line. We'll have a link on our site, snapjudgment.org. The score and sound design was by Pat Masidi Miller. That story was produced by Adiza Egan. When Snap Judgment returns, we visit the front lines of one of the biggest civil rights battles of the modern era. When our program continues, stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the metal episode. My name is Gun Washington, and if you've been following the news, you know about the people of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline to protect their land, their water, their way of life. We've seen the pictures of water protectors standing up to blizzards, to police, to water cannons in the freezing cold. Is David fighting Goliath? We sent Liz Mack to Standing Rock to find out what happens when history calls on you to step up. Snap judgment. I did wonder what I was going to do. I'm thinking about, okay, what's, what's, what's happening in this world? Am I going to go to the Standing Rock? What am I going to do? This is Lance King. He lost his trucking job a few weeks ago, and that's when he decided to come to Standing Rock. Lance was touring around with his brother's band, raising money to bring here. They're from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And this is where we're at. Last night was freezing, but it only froze whenever I got out of my, my, my sleeping bag. And my blankets were all wet for some reason. He sleeps in a tent surrounded by RVs and teepees. That's where the people who've always lived here stay, along with activists, the media, and the tourists. You can tell these tent villages apart from each other by the cardboard signs they prop up front. What does and, it smell like? Oh, it smells like a campfire. Where you see the camp and you see the fire and everything is just like the smell of the smell of wood. Some cedar, sage. Can you describe it? Sweet. Calming. It might be calm now, but that calm can be short-lived. Rumors of a raid are starting to spread, and tensions are building. And Lance, he doesn't know what he's here to do. The people he would normally look to, that he's used to following, they aren't here. I, I, I've been doubting about, about how much strength and power I have with my words and my meaning, my presence. Um, like, I always put myself in the background. Like I said, I'm the youngest boy, so you, you know, you, you're following big footsteps, you know, and you're going to try to fill those. And I almost, almost felt like I wasn't good enough. Lance is the grandson of Matthew H. King. Look him up, and you'll see he's a legend a wisdom keeper and spiritual leader for the Oglala Lakota people in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Good Lord. I, he was an amazing person. Just being around him, you will feel a presence of greatness. So when he died... My grandma answered the door, and she said, your grandpa's gone now, so it's up to you boys. My brother, Matt, he was supposed to be here. And his name was Matthew II, Matthew King. He's the one that's supposed to be doing this, not me. You know, I mean, he was... He was my teacher, like my grandfather. He was my big brother, and he was next in line. God, if you ever met him, you'd, I wouldn't even, you wouldn't even know who I was. If Matt was there, I was not around. Like, I was non-existent. Hey, 
and then he died in 2014 motorcycle accident um and then uh he's and then they left you know Tungashla called him home you know um that's when I knew it was just okay now it's me now the next morning it's Thanksgiving day across the river officers are positioned on top of a sacred ancestral burial mound the water protectors want them to leave and that starts an incredibly tense six hour standoff and so, so tell, tell me, like, how many people are down there? How many people are up there? What are we seeing? Oh, I couldn't tell you. There's you... several hundred people on the riverbank here on both sides up there. Uh, there's at least 100 cops up there. I counted over 30 shotguns and automatic weapons, semi-automatic weapons. And that doesn't include all the handguns that they've got. The tension is just boiling right now. And, and everyone is putting their face masks on. They're putting on goggles. Um, they're basically getting protect. They're getting ready to um, get attacked with some kind of chemical. You are standing on the graves of our ancestors. You are standing on the graves of our ancestors. We are asking you to leave. We are asking you to leave. When do you start to leave? When do you start? To leave? I'm looking for Lance among the crowd. Lance? Lance? Is that you? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. Nowhere. There's action on my end, but in the distance, on Highway 1806, there's also a blockade, packed with police and lined with cement blocks, barbed wire, and armored vehicles. Lance went there. As soon as I got there, Obviously, everybody was there. There was an elder sitting in the front line there on a chair. And I was wondering what was going on, so I was asking people different questions. People were angry, yelling, and the cops were actually waving for somebody to come talk. It was probably about 50 officers. Um, one had his hand on his gun, so that kind of freaked me out. I just thought, this is it. I had that thought, like, this is a trick. They're calling me over, and then they're going to tackle me and arrest me. And I told one of the guys that was standing there, I said, if anything happens to me, remember my name, Lance King, and just relay that to the, to the circle. And uh, hopefully somebody will know my, my name if anything happens. Of course, there was fear there. I'm not going to say it. There wasn't. Um, but then again, what they wanted to say was more important to me so that I can take that back to the people. I'm walking towards them with my hands in the air to show them that I'm unarmed. And that was my first immediate response, put your hands up. These guys are on full alert. They, they are ready to kill at, at the moment. So I walked with my hands up in the air and there was two gentlemen with me. They were, they were angry and I told them to, you know, calm down, we're here to talk. And, and when I got there and I started speaking with the officers, I don't know who was in charge, but he had asked me what was going on. I told him, I said, hey, um, there was a rumor going around the camp that you guys were going to invade us. <clears throat> and he said, no. He says, we're not here to do anything. We're staying on our side. You guys are going to stay across the bridge. So I proceeded to talk, reminding them that this water, we're pre protecting this water against this pipeline for you guys too. And I reminded them that anytime you guys want to lay your badges down, you can. You know. And I said, you guys can come over here and help us. Help us defeat this pipeline. He didn't say anything because everybody was like peeking over these, these, uh, those barricades to listen. And I know they're there to feed their families. Um, but I told him, I said, you don't have to have that job. I see you guys can do something else. Come and help us. Next time you get an order, I hope you can decide to say no. To carry that burden for the rest of your life is going to haunt you. It's going to carry, you're going to carry that for the rest of your life. They, they, they were nodding. Their expressions answered me. After that, I, I turned around, I went back. Then I explained to the people that we are here to protect. We are a peaceful camp. We are a spiritual camp. This is a prayer war. I said, but no way should anybody be going out and threatening those officers. I said, you guys shouldn't be doing that. We're not here for that. We're not here to fight. We're, we're here to pray. How do you, how do you feel now? 
Uh, I feel um, like I feel like a rebirth. I feel like I feel alive. I feel like a man with purpose. I never thought that I would be talking directly to the officers over there. I never thought I would ever be doing that. Like I would be, I see this on Facebook. I see these confrontations. I'm like, wow, that's, that's gotta be scary. That's gotta be just, you know what I mean? And then when I went up there, it was just, I was in that role too. I felt it was my duty to go up there. I felt like my grandfather. I felt how he looked. And I was thinking about it today when I was walking around the camp and I'm just like, I never felt so light. Like I was just like, there's nothing holding me back no more. Many thanks to Lance King for sharing his story. Lance is an Oglala Lakota headsman from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, and he's still there at Standing Rock, fighting the good fight. Snappers, you might have heard that the building of the Dakota Access Pipeline has been halted for now. But know this, the fight still continues. To read more about Lance's grandfather, check out the book Noble Red Man, Dakota Wisdom Keeper Matthew King by writer Harvey Arden. For more details, go to our website, snapjudgment.org. That original score and sound design was by Leon Morimoto, who was there on the scene, the producer, Liz Mack. You've reached the end of this episode, but the beginning of the story, even though this is not the news. In fact, you can take your dog out to do his business while eating peanut butter, only to realize to your horror that you've mixed up two very different activities, and you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is... P-R-X. If you run your own company, then you need Odoo. Odoo is an affordable all-in-one management software built to increase the efficiency and productivity of any business, regardless of size, budget, or industry. With Odoo's massive library of fully integrated applications, you can control every aspect of your company from anywhere at any time. So ditch that old, outdated software and get more done in less time with Odoo. For a free trial, go to odoo.com slash snap. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash snap.